Good morning. It is 9 a.m. in Clark County, Washington. It is April 20, 2022. We will begin by having a work session on stream health from the stream health report and then moving after that directly into council time. So staff, if you would, um, who are going to present the stream health report, if you would go ahead and introduce yourselves, you may begin. Good morning, council. Good morning. Um, I'm Justin Maynard. I'm uh, the clean water division manager. Uh, we are here, as you've said, to present the newest update to the Clark County stream health report. Uh, a little bit of background, uh, clean water staff have been collecting the data used to create this, this report or effort since around 2002. The last update was in 2010. This year, we're using a somewhat new format instead of a traditional report, and that's what we're going to be showing you. It's been assembled in a story map, and while it's mostly put together, I just want to note that it does still need some polishing. We're still working on that, and we are open to suggestions you may have to improve the product. Uh, the nice thing about this format is we can continuously improve it. Uh, the map walks through the basics of surface water quality, urban stormwater, data collection, and then it features various interactive maps that we're going to take a look at. So I'm going to turn this over to Jeff Schnabel, who I believe you already know, uh, so that he can introduce the team responsible for the hard work done to put this together. Great. Thanks, Justin. Good morning, Council. Uh, Jeff Schnabel, Stormwater Infrastructure Manager with Clean Water. Um, yeah, as Justin said, this has been a, a neat effort, a team effort between um, basically our, our staff and our monitoring and assessment group. We have four uh, senior scientists there that, that have been responsible for much of the more recent data collection uh, and a lot of the work behind the scenes in getting this report put together. And we've also been collaborating with education and outreach staff, as well as GIS staff, who, will, uh, who always make the behind the scenes mapping uh, possible and pretty. Uh, so we're, we're very excited to be able to share this with you. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Um, as Justin mentioned, it is an interactive and an updatable uh, story map format now. So uh, we are looking forward to being able to update more regularly in the future uh, as, as opposed to once every, you know, five or 10 years. So it'll be kind of nice to have that information uh, more at our fingertips. So um, we'll, you'll see as we go through, we've, we've tried to design this to, um, Kind of cater to all levels of users, right? So we, we try to include some things for folks who just want a quick skim and also information for folks that might want to do a little deeper dive into some of the information. So you'll see some of that as we uh, as we go through the presentation. Um, I think with that, I will introduce Eric Lambert and Marlena Milosevic, Marley Milosevic, who will uh, be the presenters today. Eric's going to talk a little bit in general about the story map concept and what we've done there. And then Marley, uh, uh, Eric is with the education outreach group. And then Marley is one of our senior scientists and she'll talk us through some of the new maps and, and tools that we've developed and some of the results. So I uh, will leave it to Eric at this point. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, council. Uh, I am Eric Lambert, clean water outreach specialist in the community engagement and inclusion team at Public Works. And, uh, and I helped to create this story map. Uh, you may recognize Part of the story map, especially the beginning part, um, it was it is actually part of a broader project that was grant funded back in 2019 to create uh, an explore your watershed story map, which includes other sections similar to this on uh, you know talking about uh, the beautiful watersheds and streams of Clark County, uh, actionable items that people can do at home to prevent pollution, um, also uh, fish and wildlife, and uh, and recreational activities. Uh, throughout Clark County, really as a way to engage the public and bring them closer to our waterways and also help them understand some of the uh, some of the problems that they can help be a part of solving, um, as well as um, how they can enjoy our beautiful waterways. So I'll just talk about the beginning of this part of uh, this section of the story map here, which uh, which we've pulled out and we haven't made this public yet. Um, so uh, it's your on your eyes first. Uh, and who has control of this? Uh, I'll just uh, let you know you can uh, navigate to sections below. Um, who does have control of this, this story map? Is that Rebecca? I try to share my screen. It was Marley here. Oh, Marley. Yes, Marlena. Hang on just oh. a second. Okay.
Okay. Thanks, Marley. So uh, we kind of start off at the beginning of this stream health report, really just kind of going over some of the basics of, of stream health, the things that we're looking for uh, when we talk about this, uh, a little bit of the reason why, uh, you know, measuring and monitoring stream health is important for allocating resources for understanding uh, the problem so that we can uh, use our our resources and, and technologies in the best ways we can. And so we'll go to the next section here. There's actually a, a table of contents at the beginning here, which people can drop down to different sections. We talk about some of the aspects and the characteristics of a healthy stream. We do use, uh, you know, and it wasn't hard to find beautiful pictures of Clark County streams. So we do use Clark County stream photos here. This is Lackamas Creek um, to kind of illustrate some of the different ways that uh, that a healthy stream looks for, for folks. And uh, we can go to the next section. Where we bring up the, the threats to, to stream health um, with a not so beautiful photo. This was not a photo taken in Clark County. Um, uh, but, you know, we talk about some of the different threats that are common that, that run off um, the common pollutants, including, you know, sediment and nutrients, chemicals from uh, pesticides and soaps, bacteria, uh, and, and all sorts of things. And there's an illustration there in the sidebar, which I think uh, really, you know, draws the point pretty clearly about how these pollutants that may just be in somebody's yard or driveway or street, you know, get to our stream. So, uh, so we've got that section and we can go to the next section here. Where we start talking a little bit about, you know, what our monitoring teams are doing to, to keep an eye on streams. And so we talk about the different common parameters that we look at, um, when we're assessing stream health and just really try to, um, you know, with, with these numbered list here, uh, talk about what the parameter is and, and kind of why it's important in, in, in pretty simple terms to get people primed for, uh, for some of the maps a little bit lower down. And we'll go to the next section. So we talked about water quality, looking at chemical and physical properties, and a little bit more about, about uh, biological health. Um, where we, uh, we use uh, macroinvertebrates to assess the health of, of, of streams. Um, in in that section, uh, we have Marley featured here um, doing the macroinvertebrate samples that uh, sampling that she has to do uh, every summer toward the end of the summer, where we look at different uh, different bugs in the stream basically to assess stream health, kind of like the canary in the coal mine. Uh, they're indicator species, so some bugs are more sensitive to pollution. So. If you're if you're finding a lot of those bugs, it usually means that the stream is is pretty healthy from a biological perspective. And uh, if you're finding a lot of uh, macroinvertebrates that are very tolerant to pollution, it's usually a sign that stream health has uh, some improvement that needs some improvement there. Um, and so there's a there's a chart a little bit below on the sidebar that illustrates um, <clears throat> kind of what I just talked about there and, and has a few different uh, of the species there. And you can click on some of those links to see different photos, um, to kind of give people a little bit more of an interactive experience. And then uh, we can keep going down. And I think then we jump into the part that Marley can talk more about, which is uh, which are some of the maps that we, that she has created with the help of GIS um, and the rest of the monitoring team, which really dig into some of the data. So Marley, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, hi, I'm Marley. I'm a natural resource specialist with uh, Clean Water. Um, and I am really excited to show you guys our um, data maps. Um, so this first map is a comparison of stream health um, from 2010 when we did our original report to 2020. Um, and a little bit about our um, sampling program is we have um, nine long term index sites um, that we sample every year. Um, we take monthly grab samples every month 
um, to get our, our results. Um, and then we have 42 stream sites throughout the county that we rotate through on a five year basis. Um, and we hit them up every five years and we get more data that way as well. Um, so this map to the side shows all of those uh, 51 location site lo uh, sampling locations. Um, and uh, the, the color, we have it color coded for um, different categories of health. Um, depicted on this map is the subwatershed's overall health, um, which we combined um, both the BIBI, which Eric just talked about, which is the benthic index of bio biologic integrity score, which is bugs. What kind of bugs are in the, in the stream and are they the good kind that salmon like to eat? And then the Oregon, the OWQI, which is the Oregon Water Quality Index, which um, has a bunch of different water quality parameters um, that make up that score. Um, it includes temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, total solids, inorganic nitrogen, total phosphorus, and bacteria. Um, and so we have green is going to represent our good category. Um, so that's a healthy stream. Fair is yellow and then poor is red. So looking over at this map on the side, um, I hope everyone could see. Uh, the Right now on the left side of the map, this is 2010. Um, and so we have this really cool slider bar. So if you take the slider bar and move it to the left, you're going to see 2020 data. Um, so I'm going to slide it back and forth to see kind of some of the changes, not a ton of changes, but you can see some of the, the green wa uh, watersheds up in North County are turning yellow, um, which is more uh, from good to fair. Um, so that's a cool aspect of this. And then the second part of this map um, is that we have little pop-ups when you select a site. Um, so I'm gonna use uh, Cougar Creek, Subwatershed. I'm going to zoom in on it. That's going to be my example site um, for these maps. Um, Cougar Creek is a very urbanized um, watershed uh, that has seen a lot of um, stormwater impacts. Um, our program right now is actually implementing a lot of um, projects to help uh, improve. Uh, stream water here. Um, we have the Heritage Farm Headwater Wet Headwater Wetland Restoration Project, which is in the headwaters of Cougar Creek. We have um, done stormwater retrofits on Highway 99. Um, we also have another grant coming in for more retrofitting of stormwater uh, uh, infrastructure for this subwatershed. And we also had um, a behavioral change um, pet waste campaign happen on the Cougar Creek Trail for the subwatershed. Um, so we have a lot to go going on in the subwatershed trying to help it out. Um, so I'll pop, uh, click on the pop up to show uh, more detailed information about the site. Um, this is one of our long term index sites. So we sample this site every year, um, every month. Um, and you can uh, right away see the OWQI in 2010, it was 45. 2020, it was 53, so it did um, improve a little bit um, between this, those two status. Um, and then the BIBI is still um, not great. Both of these are on a scale of one to, uh, uh, well, the OWQI is from zero to 100, and then the BIBI is from zero to 100. So having a score of six out of 100 is not very good. <laughs> um, and then the overall stream health is poor um, between these two. Um, and uh, I guess another thing I should point out is if you scroll down on the sidebar here, there's more in-depth information about the OWQI and the BIBI um, and data on this map and more information about our project as well. Um, are there any questions about this map before I move on to the next one? Uh, Madam Chair, I have questions, but I'm going to save them until we get through the presentation. I don't have any particularly to this map. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so I will move on to the next map, which is our keep scrolling. Our stream health trends map. Um, so for our stream health trends, um, we used again the OWQI, the which was the conglomeration of um, water parameters, the IBI, which is our bugs in our creek, and then we also did bacteria and turbidity. Um, so uh, let me re uh, explain our legend. Um, before I get going on this. Um, so these trends again are showing um, data from 2002 to 2020. It's so almost 20 years of data. Um, so a really big effort by our group. Um, so an upward facing arrow is going to show that water quality is trending better. Um, an approximate uh, symbol is going to show that uh, water quality is staying the same. And then a downward arrow is showing that the water quality is trending worse. Um, and so for our BIBI and OWQI, we're going to show again the status of the watts of, of that site um, by color, green, yellow, and red. Um, it is only going to be depicting 2020. BIBI will be 2019 um, data, so it'll be the most recent data we have for these sites. These are our long-term index sites that we sample every year. Um, and then bacteria and turbidity are going to be compared to the state standard, and it's just going to be a met or not met. So let me show you guys the OWQI map. And another additional thing that's pretty cool that we added is this um, second side scrolling uh, sidebar which again gives more information about what the OWQI is, um, the different variables that go into it, um, and then how we used, um, how we did our trend test, which was with the seasonal Kendall um, analysis. Um, so we can look at the OWQI um, trends and uh, two of our sites were actually increasing, which were improving in water quality well, one site was degrading in water quality, and we have five sites or six sites that are staying the same. Um, and then I'm going to stick with my Cougar Creek example, and we also have pop ups. So I'm going to show you guys a pop up of the Cougar Creek, which shows which years um, we have sampled. Um, it's showing that it was poor in 2020, but water quality is trending better at this site over the 20 year period. So if you scroll down in the pop-up, there are components of the uh, Oregon Water Quality Index. Um, these are the ones that uh, go in, make up that index, um, and we ran trends on them individually. So the inorganic nitrogen um, is actually improving in our uh, for the water quality at Cougar Creek. Many are staying the same. Total phosphorus is degrading, meaning we're getting an increase of phosphorus in the water. Um, but then total solids is improving, meaning we're having less to total solids in the water. So um, that is an improvement. Um, so that just kind of gives you a little bit more information to drill down into um, how we got this trend. Um, so I will move on to our BIBI score. Um, and these don't have you know, additional indices to show um, but you can see that four of our sites are actually um, improving in bug um, bug populations over the 20 year period where five of our streams are staying the same. So I'll click on the Cougar Creek pop up. Just taking a second to load um, and you can see a little bit better that um, in 2019 it was still poor the score, um, but it's staying the same. And then I will move on to bacteria, which you can see um, two of our sites are degrading in, uh, over time um, in water quality, while the other seven are staying the same. 
And again, these colors are um, the green is meeting the state standard for bacteria and the red is um, not meeting the state standard for bacteria. Same pop up for Cougar Creek, not met and um, staying the same. And then we'll move on to the last one, which is turbidity. Um, where we have only one site degrading, the rest are all staying the same. Um, which is Curtin Creek and then, um, again, the pop up for Cougar Creek showing not met staying the same. Um, are there any questions for this map or shall I move on to the next one? Our last map. Okay, I will move on. So our next map um, is depicting our water quality parameter results um, compared to the Washington state standards. Um, a lot of the, um, our, uh, most of our streams um, are what are called Salmonid core summer habitat streams. So that is one of the most stringent categories for us to compare our results to. Um, someone would live in our streams over the summer um, and have many of their life processes happen in our in our streams over the summertime. Um, so with that being our category, um, many of our uh, standards are if you don't meet it one month, you're out, kind of, it doesn't meet. So, a lot of these, if it looks red, it may have only missed the standard one time, one time during the month, but because of that, it totally doesn't meet the standard. Um, so our sidebar here um, has a lot of information that's really awesome that you can go in and read about the different parameters, um, why they're important, um, and more information about our project. Um, so I will start with um, bacteria. And bacteria is the only one that's not a, a one that you didn't meet it one time and you're out. This is actually using a geometric mean and uh, the 90th percentile. All the other ones are a one and done type uh, standard. Um, so the green means that it's meeting the standard, red is me meaning it's not meeting the standard. Um, and so I will again use Cougar Creek as my example. Um, bacteria is really important for the stream um, to not have it in the stream. Uh, many parameters, uh, they all connect to one another dissolved oxygen, for example, um, if there's an increase in bacteria, then you're gonna have lower dissolved oxygen, which means there's nothing for the salmon to breathe in the water. Um, so if we look at Cougar Creek's um, pop-up, you can see all the way from 2010 to 2020, it does not meet the bacteria standard. For either the geometric mean or the 90th percentile. And the colors on the map are the most current years worth of data that we have. So it could be 2020. Um, it could be the, if it was on that rotating five panel, uh, five year, it could be five years old potentially. Um, so let me show you our next one. I'm just going to kind of pop around because I know we're kind of, might be running out of time. So I'm going to show temperature. Um, temperature is one of those ones where if um, this is a measure of a seven day average, um, we continuously measure temperature in the summertime. We take a measurement every 30 minutes. We have loggers that we leave in the stream um, to get these results. And then it's a seven day average. Um, and if that 70 average goes above 60.8 degrees Fahrenheit, then it's going to fail um, to meet the state standard. Um, so a lot of um, our streams do not meet that 60.8, which is a pretty stringent um, temperature. So if we look at um, Cougar Creek again, 
Cougar Creek is actually pretty close to meeting that standard. Um, in 2011, 2012, it was 61 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're really close. And I think that's why it's so important for us to have all of our um, projects going on in that watershed. The restoration project is putting water into the ground. Um, we've got our stormwater um, facilities, cleaning water. Um, really close to meeting these state standards for Cougar Creek for temperature, which is really important for salmon. And then I'm going to show our last um, one before I move on, because I don't want us to run out of time. I'm going to show turbidity, which is really important for stormwater. Um, again, another one of those one. Uh, if you fail it once, you're failing the whole whole time. Um, and we'll show uh, Cougar Creek again. Which in 2020, it, it didn't meet the standard 1 time. Um, so it didn't, it, it failed. Um, that's what I like about these pop ups is you can kind of um, go in and see, you know, why was this 1 failing? If it, if it was only 1 time, it's not as bad as something that's failing 7 times, which it did in 2017. And then. I'm going to show you our last part for this parameter map is that we have a query table, um, which needs a little bit of polishing. Um, but for right now, I'm going to show you guys what we have for uh, Cougar Creek. Um, it's where you can actually pick whatever site you would like to see. You can then select the year um that you want to see the data for or you can select all the years if you want to see it all at once it's a lot of data <laughs> um but here's uh 2020 and you can take a look at everything that happened at cougar creek you can also uh select the parameter that you want to look at so bacteria or dissolved oxygen right away without having to go through the map if you don't want to um but right looking at this you can see all of where it's meeting the standard and where it's not meeting the standard pretty easily um, and uh, that concludes um, the presentation. So um, if there are any questions. Madam Chair, I have some. Yes, Councilor Medvici. So uh, let me start with uh, what I hope is an easy question. You know, we, uh, State Ecology had completed a study East Fork of the Lewis River watershed, and uh, and I think at the time, uh, the local regional representative was uh, Devin Restiver. Uh, we had spoken, and we won a project uh, for the Lacamas watershed. So that's where State Ecology moved uh, to our watershed in Lacamas. Uh, we are fully a year into that study. I haven't heard one word. I did send an email to her fairly recently and it bounced back. Um, I sent another email to the interim regional director and, and I still haven't heard back. So my question is, what are you hearing from ecology? What's their testing showing in our watershed uh, specific to Lacamas? Um, Jeff or Justin, do you wanna take that question? Yeah, I can I can jump in and Justin, feel free to to follow on if you have some more. Uh, good question. Thanks, thanks, Councilor Medvedi. Good to see you. Um, yeah, we Devin Rostrofer is no longer with Ecology, so that's why your your uh, email bounced back. Um, her replacement has been hired and will be starting uh, very shortly, um, and hopefully that'll be a, another uh, really strong individual like like Devin was and continue where she left off. She did a great job in the East Fork, as you know. Um, they are definitely still working hard in, in the Lacamas watershed moving forward with that project. They completed some, um, some monitoring this summer. Uh, I haven't seen the data that they collected yet. They are working on that uh, and they will be, I think, convening this year, uh, the stakeholder groups similar to the process that we did up in, up in the East Fork. And of course the county will be a, a partner in that effort. So I don't know if that gives you a whole lot of information, but it is moving. So I, I can assure you of that. Okay, well, I, first and foremost, I wanted to make sure that you were tracking with them. I'm, you know, I, at some level, I just kind of get fatigue 
uh, from hearing about all the studies uh, that go on decade after decade after decade, uh, which brings me to my um, real hard question here. You know, this to me, this great work. Thanks. This is eye opening. Um, I pretty much already had my eye on all of this already, but but I this is like walking into a doctor's office and the doctor is saying uh, you're sick, and then turning around and walking out. What do we do with all this? I mean, I, there's very few mention of a few positive trends. Uh, what I see is a lot of really concerning information about the health or lack of health in many categories uh, in our watershed. So what do we do? What do we need to do? I wanna stop studying. I wanna start taking action. We need to stop this loading uh, from whatever point sources there are, and I know that's what ecology is looking for in, in Lacamas right now. Uh, but, you know, we need to do something positive. And you know, water is precious. And I, I, because of where we live, and I came here for the water, prime, first and foremost, I moved from a drought-stricken area. I was tired of being rationed for water, tired of worrying about it, tired of the wildfire threat, Water is crucial to our life. And uh, this watershed health is just uh, one aspect of it. And I mean, I know our aquifer down towards the Columbia River is fairly healthy and robust, but as you move up towards the foothills, it get, becomes less so. Uh, but our surface water, our storm water, um, these are all concerning uh, data that you've given us here today. So, what do we do about it? So, um, I'm gonna keep oh, go think, ahead, Justin. I think I can. Yep. I, I'll let Jeff uh, add on to whatever whatever I'm about to say. But um, I, what I'd like to say is, I, I absolutely see this as completely foundational work. Um, I think it's a really important thing to present and understand. And where it gets used is actually in directing and targeting our capital budget and our, our education and outreach work. And I know Marley touched on that a little bit earlier um, when she focused on Cougar Creek. Um, seeing that Cougar is in the shape that it's in um, is the reason for targeting those those areas of you know roadways that aren't aren't you know their stormwater runoff isn't being treated right now. And that's where we have some projects focused right now. Um, the Cougar Creek Headwater uh, Wetland Restoration, and then frankly, even in the future, doing some restoration work on, on Cougar Creek to improve, um, you know, conditions across the board, hopefully. Uh, that's where this gets used. And it, it does really help us hone in on the areas where we really need to focus. And seeing some improvement in cougar creek after some of those projects went in is really it's pretty encouraging i, I know marley made a point of touching on the fact that the uh, i think it was um seven exceedances down to one over four years and you know i know that's kind of a glass half full attitude with so much red on the map but it's it it helps us both target our funds target <laughs> our, our staff effort and um see if what we're doing is effective in that in that way. And I'll let Jeff jump in and, and keep talking if he uh, sees fit to add anything else, being our, our infrastructure and monitoring manager. I think that was well put. I'll I'll let that stand and uh, unless there's a follow on. Okay, so if I what I'm getting is there are no asks, there are no priorities for us to set as a council right now, you just want to give us this foundational information. And collect whatever feedback you may have. We do value that. This is a public facing document and a big update to uh, an effort from 2010 that has its foundations in a decade ago. Okay, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So you already know my priorities, Lac Lacamas Lake and Vancouver Lake and cleaning up the nutrient loading and bacteria loading that's freely flowing into them. I wanna do whatever we can to make our lakes healthy. And for our part, that is really targeting water quality in the watersheds upstream. Um, 
big emphasis on the fact that Jeff is very, I, he, he makes a point of staying in touch with ecology and, and, you know, ensuring he's part of work on East Fork and Lacamas Creek as much as possible so that we can hopefully tailor our approach to spending capital dollars on making the biggest difference. And maybe I will make one quick comment, Ben, to, to follow on to that, um, Justin, and, and that is, you know, it is, it, it can be a little daunting looking at, at some of the, uh, the, you know, the results that we get. And uh, one thing that, you know, that we try to remember is, is it took a long time for some of these, you know, some of these systems to get where they are now. It's, it's rare that we have a silver bullet to fix something immediately, but it is really encouraging to see kind of, especially in that trend map, how many of our streams are at least holding their own, if not getting better, which is, which is significant when you look at the amount of growth and development and, and, you know, population that we have here. Um, there's, there's certainly been some advances in how we treat stormwater, how various agencies are going about their work and, and, you know, uh, the community as a whole has, has done a good job in educating folks and, and, you know, raising awareness and those things all, you know, they all chip away at the problem and, and, uh, help us move in the right direction. So uh, we are encouraged by some of those findings. I have just a, a couple of questions. One is I've always been a, a fan of ESRI and um, seeing their, their storyboards is, is something a little bit new to me actually. And um, I'm, I'm wondering how does this work? Do you use their maps and then you enter the data or how does, how, how does it work? I think we'll let Eric talk a little bit about that if he doesn't mind. He's been really instrumental in getting all of this put together and working with GIS. Yeah, thanks, Justin, and thanks for the question, Counselor. Um, yeah, uh, the data comes from uh, from our team, and we put that into a map, and we can manipulate the map in a lot of different ways to uh, you know control how it looks um, and and how things are presented, um, and then with those maps. We then put that into what we what we have here, these story maps. And story maps are relatively new, about four or five years old, I think they first mm -hmm. started. And as I think Esri was thinking, hey, you know, these maps are great for data, but how do we really communicate that data? So with the story map, you know, you got the sidebar, which can kind of give a narrative and, and have some other supplemental information as well as other types of media to try to enhance that uh, that communication. And so uh, so there's a few different templates you can choose for the story map. Um, and so really it goes from, from the data to making a map, taking those maps and putting them into the, into the story map. And there's different ways to, uh, to format the story maps. Um, the one we're looking at right now is actually uh, on, on that side, the, the bigger side, what they call the main stage, is actually like a kind of an application from Esri, which is embedded into the story map, which is uh, which allows for the carousel across the top to select different um, different things to look at into different views. So there's a lot of options. Um, again, we're we're really open to the type of feedback that that you think that can make this even better for the user. Are are the maps there uh, ESRI's aerial photography maps? That base map is uh, yeah, I think that is a base map from Esri. Mm -hmm. Great. My second question is kind of a build on to what uh, Councillor Medvedi was asking. Um, I'm interested in the application of this as well, and therefore am wondering what specifically do you intend to do by way of creating a plan, not for the whole county, but piecemeal, where you can test what you're doing that makes a difference. How are you going to approach that and where are you going to start? So, I think there are a number of opportunities there personally. Um, this is an excellent question chair. Um, we, we, uh, in multiple places, we're actually working on, we have a sub basin prioritization for sub basin planning that's tied to other other, you know, permit requirements um, where I think this data could come in handy in the future. Um, aside from that, we have our six year capital plan. Um, and while I don't know that this is necessarily directly integrated into that, it really does inform the prioritization of those capital projects that show up in that plan that uh, does go to council for approval. 
Um, so that's one aspect of that. Um, the other place where I'm I'm really seeing this, you know, long term end game here for me is seeing this all come together in one really comprehensive plan that guides our work. Uh, I think we've mentioned to council a couple of times developing a 20 year plan that really, really actually ties everything that clean water does together uh, in a pretty succinct way. And that's where I personally see a lot of opportunity to use this to, to you know, focus on on various priorities. So mm -hmm. that's that's my broad well, take and, on things. And obviously, 20 year and six year is incredibly important. No question about it because of the nature of cleaning water. And I guess I would ask, what about the shorter term? What about this year? What it, where, where is your focus going to be based on what you're seeing here, where you can then collect more data and see, are you making a difference or not? So, and that's, that's where I think I'll allude back again to the reason that, that Marley, I think really chose Cougar Creek to focus on. And that's that we have a number of projects going on in that sub watershed. And I think that's our opportunity for evaluating as we continue to collect this data in Cougar. We're hoping to see improvement as those projects get built and that will take a couple of years. Um, I think heritage farm, we're looking at 2024 for completion and I'll let Jeff correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, we have a couple of grant funded filter projects that are. Finishing up design pretty soon here, I think. Um, again, Jeff Jeff has a little bit more familiarity with that. So, with with our focus on on Cougar Creek right now, with our capital projects, and with Eric's work on pet waste, um, that's where we have the biggest opportunity, I think, right now in the really short term um, mm -hmm. to really take a look at Cougar Creek's data and and evaluate whether what we're doing is effective. That's that sounds terrific. So something that I would be interested in at some point um, is what are you doing at Cougar Creek and what's the before and after in, in two years or year and a half, whatever your, your time frame is, what are the measurements then that that show any impact? Um, probably there'll be a lot of impact and that may be a great learning tool for other parts of the county. I think that could make an excellent case study. Yeah, it certainly could. And with your your focus on that right now, and it's certainly in the red, you'll be able to see differences. Hopefully. Thank you, Chair. I think that's actually a wonderful suggestion. <laughs> I'm not that one. That one's going to stick with me. <laughs> Good. Well, I'll be interested in what the changes are so that um, we can understand the real impact. That's that's what everybody wants to know. You know, what are the results? Not just in the aggregate, it, which kind of gives that pessimistic picture that Council Medvigi was referring to, and I sense that too, but in the in the, the microcosm there where you're really focused on making improvements and yeah, there are results that that's what we'd like to understand how you got there. Yeah, other questions or comments from council. Uh, Chair, yes, Chair? Chair? Yeah, go yes. ahead. Sir. Councilor Lenz. Uh, thank you. Um, staff, thank you for this. I, uh, I really appreciate it and to kind of go to some of the questions that you were asking in the purpose of the, the work session. Uh, I think that the presentation format on this is uh, very strong and very user friendly uh, and really appreciate the detailed and yet readable uh, uh, information in the sidebar throughout. And the, I think the pop ups are very usable. Uh, I think that the directions that are given to how to use the map are also very clear. That said, as I was reading along, it there were some moments where it took seeing what Marley was doing to help me understand the sentence of, oh, that's where you look for the eye or that sort of thing. Like you're in this, look for this box. That's what they mean when they say this thing. Um, so I'm curious about how your 
road testing it and if you are taking it to uh, community members to see additionally how folks are interacting with it and if there may be tweaks that you can make in that way. Um, I make this suggestion not knowing where it would live, so it may not be useful at all, but I nonetheless am going to say it because of the, the use of seeing kind of the walkthrough. If there were an opportunity somewhere to post essentially a walkthrough video, say, using Cougar Creek or something else as an example to show uh, an interested community member exactly how to click and how to use it. That might be an interesting short little, you know, 2 minute video that could help. Increase accessibility for this. Um, I very much appreciate uh, Councillor Bowerman, Chair Bowerman's uh, suggestion about the case study. And I curious um, went to ClarkWatersheds.org just to see what else was there and really appreciate all of the additional information and the formatting of that information. And I think that there are great spaces within that website and the other information you're putting out there to perhaps talk about case studies uh, and successes or works in progress that can help the community understand why what is being done is working and what your approach is to moving forward and solving uh, these uh, these problems that we have in our community and increasing the quality of uh, of our our water here in Clark County. One more thing um, that I of course just lost. Uh, I think um, we do need to tell the stories of what is working and what the plans are. Ah, I remembered my other thing. It's very easy to say we need to do better. We need to do more. Um, I appreciate your systemic approach and making sure that we know what the problems are that we're trying to solve in a very specific way before simply uh, diving in and trying to throw solutions at problems without fully understanding them. Um, as always, it takes resources to do these things. So uh, when we get to a place where you know specifically what needs to be done and need to work on it, I would certainly hope that as those resources are needed, we become very aware of it so that this council that clearly does support your work can have the opportunity to consider continue to support it by making sure it's properly funded. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lentz. Um, that's an excellent uh, point about the uh, instructional video and, and uh, adding clarity to it. Eric had had briefly mentioned the possibility of that yesterday, and I think this confirms that that's something that we should really be interested in. Um, so I, I think that's that's input that we all really appreciate. Um, aside from that, as far as kind of pilot testing this, the the immediate opportunity that pops into my head is really showing a very interested group of people, the Clean Water Commission. Um, it's it's nine members of the public who are really eager to to contribute and um, I think they'd be really excited about kind of being a pilot test group for this. Um, That's a great place to start. Yeah. And Madam, Madam Chair, I'd like to kind of segue off of what's been said so far and focus on your comments because I'm not sure um, if mine were readily understood. So, I mean, no matter what we do, we need to measure success. Uh, so, my comment about study fatigue, I mean, I'm seeing it Lake Vancouver, seeing it Blackamas Lake. I mean, we do studies in the 80s and 90s and the 2000s, and we just keep redocumenting the issues instead of actually fixing it. You know, growing up in the East Coast where we had dramatic problems uh, in the New York area, I mean, they were dumping sewage and garbage into the Hudson River and just off the Jersey Shore, thinking it would just go away. You know, there were dramatic steps to clean that up and stop it. So when we talk about measurement and no matter what we do, whether it's a homeless encampments or dirty lakes, what the public will see is what we accomplish. So, as far as metrics and case studies, I mean, I just want to be clear. 
Lake Vancouver and Lacamas Lake are increasingly and heavily used for recreation. And I didn't see any metric for uh, tracking algae blooms, but those beaches, the contact for humans and animals alike has been constantly and increasingly posted as hazardous. Don't let the water touch you. For kids and adults and pets, our algae blooms, our uh, weed infestations. I mean, we, we have the water just looks plain gross. And that's where our citizens see of our beautiful lakes. So I would really like to make some dramatic and concrete as far as capital investment. I want to see these lakes cleaned up, whatever it'll take in our impacts in our watershed. And we know you've named some of those uh, creeks, you know, Lacamas Creek is one of them going into Lacamas Lake. You know, so that that's my policy goal is to put focus and investment into what we need to do today and in six months and in a year so that we can stop posting this hazardous water signs and keeping people out of our lakes. I think we all agree with that. And is the algae bloom measured in any of uh, the four criteria that you have up here? Not directly, although I, okay. I think if, and Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, public health is doing some some work on modeling algae blooms and actually so is uh, Lower Columbia Estuary Partnership. Should be interesting to see what they produce. Um, Obviously, there are uh, water quality constituents that cause that eutrophication that, you know, may be indirectly touched on by these criteria that we're looking at in those upstream watersheds. So, mm -hmm. and that's what I mean when I say it's not directly, but these are very important elements of it. Is there further discussion from Council? I think we are great presentation. very well informed on on uh, this uh, stream health report now, and uh, thank you for covering that today with us. Thank you for your time, Council. Bye bye. Well, I believe now we're ready to move directly into council time.